Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of Aperio's micro conferences. My name is Patrick Masson. I'm the executive director of the Aperio Foundation. And I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as I think I've mentioned before, the Aperio micro conferences started off as a uh, supplement or information fact finding activity for the Aperio uh, board. Uh, when it uh, started its strategic review and analysis that was going on. And the idea was to uh, get together a lot of open source and higher ed and um, ed tech folks, uh, leaders and innovators in, in those areas to help them or to invite them in to help the board uh, better understand the key issues and some of the drivers and things that are happening across those uh, communities and thus help Aperio better understand how it can support our projects and our communities. So from that initial activity and, and discussions, uh, we thought, wow, these are really interesting and are providing some great information. So we've uh, opened these up and started inviting the entire community uh, of not only Aperio, but our higher ed uh, folks, um, ed tech folks. Um, and they've really been a great uh, uh, activity to, to, to help us focus and find out about some of the things that are happening across these communities. Um, this is actually our second year. Um, we can't believe it. It's been a whole year. Um, the all of the of the uh, prior um, micro conferences are online on YouTube and um, Aperio's YouTube channel. So I invite you to check those out and uh, look at past presentations. Um, I'm very excited to start today for a couple of reasons. Um, First of all, uh, Simon's uh, our first interview style so um, approach here. So I apologize uh, ahead of time for, in case my interview skills are, aren't quite uh, what you're used to um, or what you might expect. Um, but uh, Simon and I have known each other for about, uh, gosh, 10 plus years uh, when I started at the OSI. Simon was the uh, uh, OSI board president, uh, not only once, but twice. Um, and he's been involved in open source activities in a variety of ways um, in roles as uh, directors of various boards, the Document Foundation. Um, he's also very much engaged in standards and open standards work. Um, he's internationally recognized as an expert uh, delivering uh, keynotes and um, authoring a variety of articles in, in global publications. Uh, I honestly can't think of anyone that's probably uh, more aware of and engaged in uh, open source um, policy, um, practice, principles, and so on. It's a, he's a great resource for me professionally, uh, and he's a great guy too. So I'm very excited to have him here. And um, other than what's on the board here or on the screen here, Simon, is there anything, uh, current activities or highlights you want to touch on to catch probably me and everyone else up to speed on what you're up to? Um... Um, 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 well, I mean, I'm, I'm currently working at OSI as their director of public policy and open standards. Um, role that I've been getting started uh, with a dev room I'm uh, arranging at FOSDEM in Brussels in two weeks um, about public policy. Um, I'm, I've, I, I, I quite like doing geeky things as well. So there's a lot of toys behind me on the uh, in the in the office that you can see um i don't know what else to tell you really uh if there's the stuff that's on the screen uh, i have a cat who i hope is going to join us uh i've been left home alone so if the front door rings i'll have to go and deal with it um that's about it all right great um well i thought we we just touch on three very small simple not complex not a lot of you know simple topics here um and I think what's interesting is if we look at these topics, and I hope to sort of uh, ask sort of questions around the, diff the different perspectives of organizations and communities and how these are impacting them. So just quickly as an example, software regulations, how do Aperio projects, um, how does Aperio as a foundation and how do uh, adopting users and so on might um, be impacted or what are the impacts for those different types of organizations? So not just about these topics around foundations, software regulations, and, and even broader technologies, but how those are impacting those different communities, those different 
uh, groups of people that are working with an open source. Um, so I think I'm, I think I've quoted you quite a few times with the uh, enough foundations already, yes. um, which is back in 2015, uh, we delivered a keynote for the OzCon conference. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. What was the motivation for us as, you know, someone who's involved in a foundation? I'm curious if you could highlight your ideas behind that and what that, what you meant by enough foundations already. Uh, well, I, I think you have to ask why an open source project or a, an organization wants to call itself a foundation. Uh, so what we generally mean by a foundation is that something is a, a long term uh, uh, capital anchored uh, charity that is in the public interest. That's typically what we mean by a foundation. Um, now, that. Uh, definition has gradually drifted in the open source world and the word foundation is now used to describe uh, organizations that are community oriented. Um, the use of the word foundation doesn't really give you any clues anymore about the governance of the organization. And at the time that I gave that keynote, um, the Linux Foundation was busy creating lots of subdivisions of itself and calling them something or something foundation and if you look at linux foundation now it is uh, it is a, a raft of uh, little foundations that are all actually the linux foundation when you lift the wrapper and look at it uh, in legal terms what's underneath the wrapper is actually just the linux foundation and uh, some governance rules to create a sub community and so i, I spent some time asking why do, why does everyone want to be a foundation and the reason i think is because the idea of foundation communicates to individuals the idea of uh, of uh, independence public service uh, impartiality um, uh, the idea of acting in the interests of uh, an undefined public community and then when you look at things that call themselves foundations you discover that that's not necessarily the case. So I mentioned the Linux Foundation just now. Uh, in the US, the Linux Foundation is a, uh, a 501c6. That means that it's actually a trade association. Uh, it, is, uh, it has members who pay subscription fees, and the foundation exists to serve the needs of the members who pay the subscription fees. So although they will argue that they act in the public interest extensively and they're, and they're correct in many ways, their actual legal incorporation is there to serve the needs of its paying members who are the largest corporate corporations in the technology space. They are organizations like uh, IBM and Oracle and Microsoft and uh, Qualcomm and Ericsson are all members of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and then you find other organizations uh, like, for example, the Python Software Foundation, C3. It exists to serve the general public. And so although it may have members that are paying fees to participate in the organization, it has a legal duty to serve the public, not to serve the paying individuals who keep the organization afloat. And then you find other organizations that are neither of those things, like, for example, um, the, the, the Rocky Linux Enterprise, the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation, which is the organization behind Rocky Linux, which is actually a for profit corporation in Delaware that just uses the word foundation because it looks good. And then they, they've made themselves a, a B Corp, which is a, a, a kind of a rolling commitment to not be evil, but really doesn't say that you're going to serve anyone other than the. And uh, so you look at all of those different uses of the word foundation and you realize that it isn't actually a reliable indicator anymore that tells you that an organization is going to ha going to act in the public interest. And you have to dig deeper to find out whether that's the case. And what do you think? So looking at those three organizations um, and I wonder what are the core services what are the benefits for a project let's say you know so uh, 
why would they join a foundation? What are the things that deliver the most value to the maintainers and developers and even the broader community that relies on those tools? You know, what, what would a project look at to understand whether or not it aligns with the morals and ethos and practices and principles of one of those foundations? Well, well the foundations offer different services to the communities that they serve. Uh, most commonly, they offer um, uh, technical software developer services. So things like a, a Git repository that can be shared by all the members, um, a download server for downloading the software, um, forum space to hold discussions, uh, a host for mailing lists. Those are all very practical tool-based arrangements. Um, not every uh, not every open source foundation does that. So there are some foundations, like for example, um, the the Drupal Foundation, <coughs> excuse me, which is there to perform Drupal marketing for the community, and the development isn't necessarily their 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 focus. It's the same with the WordPress Foundation. The development of the of the uh, the actual open source project isn't actually their priority. Their priority is to develop and maintain a community, and then you get uh, other foundations for whom the the, the technical capabilities are definitely an aspect of what they do. But the Linux Foundation is a, is a, a, a venue for engaging in market making. It's a, a space where uh, vendors can go to have discussions without engaging in antitrust behavior. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so the, the, the services that a foundation offers vary depending on their community. In evaluating them, you have to look at their governance and ask questions like, who are the beneficial owners? So by beneficial owner, what I mean is, who are the organizations or people who, if the organization was to collect too much money and it had to, dis had to dispense it around people, who would get that money? So in, a, in most for-profit corporations, the beneficial owners are the shareholders. And if there is a surplus of money, they get a dividend. Uh, but in a 501c3, there are no beneficial owners. If there is a surplus of money in a 501c3, the only thing you can do with it is spend it on the mission. And uh, then other types of organizations have got similar arrangements. So you, the first question that I always want to see answered about any foundation is who are the beneficial owners? because ultimately the beneficial owners are the ones who are being served by whatever the organization is doing. <coughs> and do you think that the core, the, the value proposition, the core services um, and support that a foundation offers, and let's use the 501c3, that's what a perio is, that's where we work. Do you think the those services um, differ today uh, the what projects need we'll start with projects what projects needs from a foundation differs from 2015 as you said you know there was often about infrastructure and providing yes. um, core infrastructure but most projects can spin that up on their own they don't need a really a foundation for doing that maybe they need the nonprofit status to collect donations and some banking and accounting services and things like that but what are some more uh maybe some areas that uh, projects may not have capacity themselves or that are new and emerging that might not fit into the skill set that the, that the typical developer group has that are that, you know working around open source right. technology projects well I, I actually don't think that the main value of foundations is in providing infrastructure or practical services uh, i think the reason why everyone wants to call themselves a foundation is because uh, when any group of people gets together to scratch a shared itch and make an open source project, eventually they discover that somebody has to own the stuff. And uh, it turns out that when you when it's more than about four of you, that's a really difficult problem of who owns the stuff. Uh, so who, who actually owns the, the trademark that the organization is working under or that the, particularly that the project is using as its name? Who, who, who owns the domains? Who's got the right to change things? Uh, who is it that uh, has committed to make sure the bills are paid? Uh, who is it that uh, settles arguments? 
who is it that is responsible legally for the actions of the organization? And as soon as you, that group of three or four of you that have decided to do something together, think about those questions. Quickly, you say, oh, we should start an organization to be responsible for those. And, and that's, that's what we mean by um, uh, uh, having a, a, a oversight over an organization. Uh, it is the, the act of being a fiduciary is the key role of a foundation. And by fiduciary, what we mean is not fun fundamentally about money. It is fundamentally about being a stable, trustworthy entity. It's from the, the Latin fideles, meaning faith. It's that the, the organization is able to be an anchor for the good faith of the, of the community. And I think that's the primary role that a foundation plays. And that's why I go looking to find out who the beneficial owners are, because um, uh, I, I question the good faith of an organization that tells me it's a foundation and then turns out to have beneficial owners. Uh, so I, I think that that has remained constant throughout time. And that's still the reason people start foundations today is to solve that problem of who owns the stuff. Um, and then that who owns the stuff problem has then got a corollary, which is who speaks for us. And uh, working out who it is that speaks for us is the, is the, the big question for the larger foundation, like Aperio, is who is it that has standing to decide the direction that the organization takes, which services it provides, how it represents itself in public, what its principles are, what its what its moral compass looks like. Um, and those are also fiduciary questions, but those are fiduciary questions for the larger or, or more mature organization. And I don't think anything has changed in those things since 2015. I think what you look for in a foundation is, is a, a fiduciary. And all that has changed is that it's become a lot more complex to work out whether that fiduciary is indeed a safe pair of hands to leak, to own all the stuff for you. And so what about from the perspective of adopting organizations? So in the context of Aperio, we have projects, there's Zerti and Sakai and Kaz and these projects that have joined Aperio and are now housed and, and part of the Aperio community. Um, but what about is any any impact or in, you know how do organizations how might they so I'm thinking of campuses so if there's UCLA or or Oxford or whatever it might be is and, and I guess there's a this is analogous to how any other organization a business or might get involved with a foundation are there are there key attributes or or things that you look at or those organizations that look at that not only help them assess the quality of the open source project, you know, does it get released and are the bugs fixed and are the features added and all that sort of stuff and is there community around it? But what might there be um, a sort of assessment that happens for the foundation itself? I mean, it's a different perspective than a project coming in to look for a home mm -hmm. and services. What are those attributes or features that a, an organization might look at a foundation for right so the, it's actually fiendishly difficult to assess the, the uh, foundation um because as as uh, lawyers will always say whenever you ask them a question that they it, that costs money to answer it depends um <laughs> and uh when you try and draw up a, a score a score sheet for foundations, you discover that there are many, many factors. So I did. I've done this twice now uh, on my in my career. I, I had a I go at it in two thousand and ten, and then I had a go at it again about four years ago, trying to work out what are the metrics for a, a, a secure foundation, and and there are many different dimensions, uh, and they're not necessarily all quite what you would imagine. Uh, uh, you know, being democratic isn't necessarily good for example um and uh, actually being a meritocracy isn't actually necessarily good and yet both are also essential uh and um so I, I think that's a really difficult question and i think that the question that i would ask for any foundation like aperio is uh, i'd i'd flip it around i'd say how do you how do you earn the trust of your members every year uh, because that that's that's really the big question is how, how you know how do I know 
that the money that you're receiving is being well spent. Uh, how do I know that uh, you are not compromising in ways that are unacceptable? Um, because everyone compromises, you know, the, the whole, the real, in real life, everyone has to draw a line somewhere. It's all about doing it knowingly rather than having it sprung on you. And that's the, that's the, the essence of mature choice is knowing what your compromises are and, and making them thoughtfully and defensively. And so th that's really what I would expect from a foundation. So I would expect a perio to ha have some place, an explanation of its finances and, and, uh, you know, why do you ask for money and and what do you do with it and how do you hold it responsibly and what would you do if you had too much and and who's making the decisions who's on your board how did they get there and uh were they were they were they were they a good choice and how do you evaluate those directors i want to see the answers to lots of questions like that when i'm looking uh and there isn't really one factor to look at i see a question there from gail uh gail right. commenting, commenting there saying that you know that these are all the the someone's got to own the stuff is a compelling reason to stand up a foundation um so why did i say enough foundations already well i don't think you should people should stop creating new genuine foundations because they are exactly what you need to act as the fiduciary anchor for a group of colleagues friends or um at least like-minded people with a shared mission. The challenge is that at the time that I gave that talk, foundations were proliferating at the rate of about one a week. And it wasn't obvious that they were even necessary because <clears throat> you could also use as a fiduciary anchor, a public fiduciary. So there's an organization called Software Freedom Conservancy that will act as the fiduciary for an open source project so that you don't have to have any of these governance things yourself. They'll look after your They'll own the copyright for you if you really need that. They'll own your trademarks. They'll look after your money that you've collected from your supporters and users. They'll uh, handle the procurement process for spending the money. They'll do all of those sorts of things. And they do it in a very well-documented and transparent and very safe way. So they're a really good fiduciary. And I would say to a small project starting up, well, you know, why, why even bother trying to make a foundation when Software Freedom Conservancy is offering the public interest or Commons Conservancy in, in Europe, or uh, the Centre for Computer Solutions in Germany. There's, there are many of these umbrella fiduciaries that exist who can look after your project. Um, the answer where there's a big solution space, uh, like for example, in the Eclipse ecosystem, where there are many projects that are well served by having a specialist foundation, or in the education sector, which is well served by having an organization like Aperio, that in those places, you definitely need a foundation. Um, I think the, so the, the the real statement is to say, stop making foundations, just go join one, is really how I would summarize that talk, which was only a five minute talk at OSCON in 2015. But lots of people seem to remember it for some reason. I don't know why. It's, it was a bold uh, statement. And I can remember uh, probably around the same time, um, um, I was actually uh, giving a presentation at a perio. And I had a slide that was uh, more joiners, fewer starters. Um, and I had looked up and at the time there were over 300, I found over 300 learning management systems. And it's like, do we really need 300 open source learning management systems? Or might there be an opportunity for folks to uh, come together and work on, you know, there might be differences around technology or pedagogy or something like that, but do we really need those? So maybe this, it's the same idea for, for foundations. Um, I do want to see, I see Anne-Marie has a question as well. Um, and thinking I think it's your next on your list. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I think she's telling me to hurry up. Um, <laughs> so uh, thinking into the future uh, with regulation of software in multiple jurisdictions, what's the role of a foundation, solo or together, in supporting projects and policymakers? And I'll add, I think, is this a new, uh, a broader scope of services. Uh, are foundations um, taking on this um, role uh, to address the emergence of these, or has policy and practice always been something that foundations do? So both the specific question and then a, sort of tying back to our previous conversation. Right? Okay, so so software has had a, something of a charmed life for the last, whatever it is, 60 years. 
uh, because it's been able to to uh, plausibly say that it's exempt from many of the rules that apply to other other forms of product in the market. Um, so uh, you, you'll have seen in a lot of uh, software licenses at the end, there's a big section, unreadable section in block letters, uh, which and that that section in block capitals says something to the effect of <clears throat> we accept no liability for anything bad that happens to you because you use this software and the reason that that is in block capital letters is because in the us the statutes direct that disclaimers of liability must be prominent and the only way that anyone could make a textual disclaimer prominent in 19 in the 1970s was by putting it all in block capitals because there was no there were no there was no yellow highlighter and there was no there wasn't even a flash attribute and so we're stuck with this legacy from the 60s and 70s in having block caps disclaimers now um software has now eaten the world and um, what that that rather bold phrase means is that everything is now software so you may think some things are, are hardware but silicon chips aren't hardware silicon chips are written in software they're written in a, in a language like verilog and they are compiled using a tool chain with compilers and and uh, image processors to create a, a mask to make the silicon chip the, the silicon chip is just the 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 output artifact of a piece of software uh the most of the devices we use i'm surrounded by devices here most of these devices are very dumb pieces of equipment that are only smart because they have software running in them or they connect to somewhere that software is running and so we've now reached a world where the majority of products in the consumer market are actually software products. Uh, in the European Union, that is described as products with digital artifacts, is how they describe that. Uh, and they note that there are some products where the product is only digital artifacts, and that's a way of saying software. Um, now, the ability to disclaim liability in a software license has meant that for years no one has taken responsibility for the software you're running so if you're if you're running microsoft office and it ruins your life you can't make a claim against microsoft uh, because everything you used it for was was your own work and actually there's a disclaimer in the license anyway now in europe that is no longer the case in europe there has been a new piece of legislation um, that is called the product liability directive and it has extended the liability of suppliers away from physical goods and extended it to software as well. And so starting with the coming into force of the product liability directive, which is in about three years time, in Europe, um, producers will have to take liability responsibility for the digital artifacts in their physical products. And that means all software will be subject to public liability and then the uh, European Union has done another thing, which is it said that software is often the source of risk in products. And uh, that can no longer be left to, the, uh, to, to be unaddressed because every other class of product has to go to underwriters laboratories or to the FCC to be approved. So why not the mark that you put on a product to say that it is a physical product which is safe to use under european statutes is called the ce mark and you'll have seen that c mark on pretty much everything you buy <clears throat> so again starting with the coming into force of a new piece of legislation called the cyber resilience act all digital uh, uh, artifacts in physical products as well as all pure digital artifacts aka software will have to have a c mark from the moment that it is placed on the market and that's a massive change that means that suddenly this whole software ecosystem which has grown so uh you know kraken like with tentacles everywhere you know it, it has now come under the safety uh auspices of the market regulatory authorities of uh, all of the european countries and just as we've seen with the California effect, there is also the European effect. When they start regulating on globally distributed products, everyone has to listen, not just Europeans. So it's all changing. And 
that means that there's a new role for uh, software foundations because they will need to be at very least watchful for the liabilities and consumer responsibilities of their contributors and members. Now, I, I've worked on the CRA all year for, on behalf of OSI, and we have made sure that the CRA does not uh, accidentally affect the production of software. Uh, because open source software is produced in public, um, it is subject to scrutiny for proprietary software is. Proprietary software only becomes public and only the, the digital artifact, the binary artifact, becomes visible on the day it's placed on the market. Open source software is visible long before anyone places it on the market. <coughs> and so we've had to make sure that the CRA doesn't accidentally place burdens on the development process. Because of that, most open source foundations per se do not have any responsibilities under the CRA. But it's going to be very important for open source foundations to work out um, what edge cases there are and also what the consequences are for their contributors and their downstream users and to make sure that they behave responsibly because um, imagine that you are a company that consumes i don't know a piece of software like busybox um, busybox will not come with a ce mark because it's open source and the developers don't need to do that but if you ship a product that depends on busybox you'll have to put a ce mark on it and so that would mean that it. That would mean that a community that was supporting that product, if it was behaving responsibly, would make sure that the downstream developers were able to get the information they needed to do their certification. So I think there's a very significant role for open source foundations that's going to arise from this change of, of, of stance. And this is just the first. There's another nine regulations coming down the pipe that are going to change the whole landscape for how software looks in the European market. And uh, Washington is just behind us. And so talk a little bit more about that, the third party provider, if you will. So uh, a company, we several of Aperio's uh, projects are fortunate enough to be um, supported and delivered and, and by companies. Is the onus now on that company to uh, comply with the CRA? And, and, and uh, what is that relationship now? How does that work? Or what's so, the proposal? And also, what's the actual status of the CRA? I know it was okay. uh, gone through a couple legislative uh, movements there. Uh, so the, the CRA, the, its status is that the, the final, we, I have the final text, and it will come to a European Parliament vote um, no later than March this year. And then it will come into effect, we think, two years after the, the date that it's passed in the Parliament. There's a clause in the bill that says, we're going to give you some time to get ready. And I think that time is two years. Uh, so it, so the CRA is a done deal, can't change anything now. The only thing we can change is how it's interpreted. And so one of the things that the community is going to do at FOSDEM is make sure that we're going to get the people who wrote the CRA on stage and tell us what it means for open source. And we're going to video them. So you'll know what it means for open source because <laughs> because uh, the, the people who wrote it are going to tell you. Um, and then... And then touch, touch that's, a little that's, bit more about uh, the impact on, on, on commercial or third party uh, distributors, providers. Okay. Support so the, the CRA deals only with software that is placed on the European market. And, and that phrase placed on the market has a, a precise technical definition. <clears throat> but what it means colloquially is that when you make uh, the software available in return for compensation of some form, be that compensation for the provision of a service, compensation through the collection of surveillance information for advertising or being paid for advertising within the software or compensation in, in the form of a license fee. All of those are enough to trigger the availability of the software on the market. So as soon as anybody places a piece of software on the market, it must comply with the CRA. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions for software that is covered by other legislation, like in aircraft and in mobile phones. But basically it's all software and anywhere it occurs in any embedded in whatever device. At the point the product is placed on the market, 
the party placing it on the market is responsible for compliance with the CRA. And they demonstrate their compliance with the CRA by putting a CE mark somewhere in the software on, or on the packaging. So typically on the, uh, the about box on your software screen or on the plate on the back of the device. And if that CE mark appears, then the market surveillance authority can fine you an unbelievably large sum of money if it turns out you weren't telling the truth when you put it there. Uh, so it, it is extremely serious to put the, to make sure that you know what you're talking about before you put that CE mark there. And then there is a process in the CRA for what you have to do to comply with the legislation that is mostly to do with knowing your supply chain, uh, having sound processes, having fast processing when de uh, material defects appear or, or CVEs, uh, and uh, generally, oh, oh, and supplying updates free of charge to consumers. If you do all of those things, you can almost certainly put a C mark on your product. And what's been the response from those who are going to be able to comply in their potential uh, interface with the open source software they might be embedding in their products, services? Uh, well, so far, we haven't heard a lot from many of those people. Uh, I did have a meeting with the commission last week with the Debian community, who are very concerned indeed about this, because the Debian com community has a lot of small, what I call digital artisans, uh, you know, uh, smaller providers who are making a living by doing uh, personalized, small, local activities with the software. I think it will apply to quite a few of Aperio's downstreams. <clears throat> because I think you're you're you've got quite a lot of people globally who are in that position of being a digital a digital artisan, um, and we haven't heard a lot yet. I think partly because that most of those people are, are unaware that there is a new burden coming their way. Now, having said that, you've then got to put it into proportion. So the CRA is going to be enforced by market surveillance authorities. So that that those are the people who do weights and measures they're the people who check that your grocery stores scales are weighing the correct weights those people have got um they've they've got this much money to handle this much responsibility and what they're typically going to do in this area is go and make an example of a couple of big cases to try and scare everybody into compliance um we're we as a as a, a group of people who've been looking at the cra don't think there's going to be a lot of immediate harm. And we think that as the, if, if great harm is going to start happening, I think you're going to get plenty of warning because you'll notice market surveillance authorities are beginning to, to big themselves up and tell you they're coming because they actually don't want the bother of having to enforce. They would much rather you complied because enforcement is very, very time consuming and expensive. So stepping back maybe a little bit and, and talking about open source, um, in these, you know, embedded in products and service or as provided as services. I mean, that leads to questions. Well, there's all sorts of cloud providers that are using open source, the Internet of Things, and and uh, you know, the, I know the OSI is working on um, an open uh, definition for AI. Talk a little bit about um, how open source as a as a movement, and then and sort of more practical practical aspects, um, how those. Uh, principles and practices that have enabled open source either are complementing or conflicting with these different, um, you know, broader technology uh, activity that's going on out there. Okay. Whatever ones you happen to think are most scary that we should all know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so one of the things I've been doing recently is I've been, I've been uh, reviewing the, the, the words I use to talk about um, open source because the, the challenge of, Let's take AI, for example. <clears throat> Before anyone complains, I know that AI is neither uh, intelligent or, or indeed artificial intelligence. But I find that talking about statistical models and machine learning is so much of a mouthful that I prefer to say AI. Um, the, 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 the difficulty with AI is that very little of what is AI is software. Uh, AI is mostly an accumulation of um, statistical results. Uh, so it's basically a very big database, or if not a very big database, a very complex, well-compressed database, and a bunch of uh, software that then does predictable things based on that database. 
so it's it's quite straightforward to make the software part of an ai open source and in in many cases it already is the bit of an ai that is not so easily fit into the open source definition is the training data who owns that what are the what are the uh, licensing rights um the model um how do i how do i understand it how do i manipulate it how do i interpret it and then the the application of the model so the then there's the weighting on the model and there is its application for the downstream purpose and all of those things outside the software you can't really apply an open source license to them uh, it doesn't really work and the assumptions about open source licenses that, that for example there is a source form that corresponds to the production version that, that doesn't really doesn't really work you know there is no source form of an open of a, an ai model uh, an ai model is a statistical database um so I, i've been trying to roll back a little from there and say well what do we mean by open source in in an ai and ultimately i think what we've always meant by open source is the agency of individuals. The reason we did open source to begin with wasn't out of a fascination with source code or of a desire to save money. Ultimately, most of us who actually did open source, it was about being free to do the thing. And open source licenses make you free to do the thing with software. But agency in other areas means different things. <clears throat> so, for example, agency as a citizen is isn't really about access to uh, to the the the, the, uh, the law, access to the public code. It's about access to to counsel. It's about access to the courts, and agency there is expressed in terms of: Am I free to 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 go to a court and make a complaint? Agency in legislation is to do with, do I have a representative who will listen to me and represent me in Congress? And open source, the core thing that open source is there to do is to deliver agency in technology. And so then looking at AI, the question that I ask is, how do we make sure that an AI leaves me with agency? And in what sense do I mean that I'm left with agency? Now, in those sorts of cases, agency typically means being free to veto a conclusion, uh, being free to understand the reason why a conclusion was reached, being able to predict that a conclusion would be re reached given the same inputs as the AI has got. All of those are, are uh, what agency means there. And then with IoT, what does agency mean there? And then with other technologies, with cloud, what does agency mean there? And I, I think this is where I'm returning to as I look at these new technologies. I don't think open source is um, can be taken per se and applied to those areas. I think the principle that started open source is what you have to take to those areas, which is the, the need and com compulsion to demonstrate user agency. So taking that, that, that it's really about the principles and of agency and, and there seems to be an abstraction between, you know, the, 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 the end user and the tool where, I mean, I think of cloud, how much I was at a recent conference and I was trying to, I was asking folks, of, and, you know, how they're using open source and, and so on. And, and they said, oh, we don't run anything. We're in the cloud. So they're not using open source. So there's this layer, of this this one degree of separation, and I wonder, you know, that that you hear open AI, and you've just as you've just explained um, or, or or mentioned that it's it's it, it's not the the you know open source is different. Do you think there's a sort of I know there is a post open source, the famous sort of tweet of you know kids today something don't like open source they just say beep and put it on github i mean do you think that because open source is now core open source is now default open source is now everywhere open source is a few degrees of separation on folks do you think that there's a, a lack of appreciation or awareness of open source and so in that sense that we're in a post open source 
uh, world? I don't actually think it's specific to open source. Uh, I think that people, uh, for whatever reason, choose not to be aware or act on the realities of the technology they're using. So, for example, um, you know, people use uh, Meta's products, despite the fact that um, Meta almost certainly was the reason that we had Brexit in the UK by allowing uh, researchers to micro target uh, swing voters and affect the outcome. The strong possibility that the reason that Mr. Trump won your first election in the US was because of Meta. Uh, those though people kind of overlook those things because they like using using Facebook so much. They really enjoy using WhatsApp. They like using Facebook Messenger. And so they believe that the aspect of their agency that matters more is the convenience of the software than the possible misuse of the uh, metadata accumulated by the provider. And the same thing applies to, 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 to uh, the effect that the post open source effect that you're speaking of there ultimately is the effect of GitHub. GitHub makes it very easy for you to place your software and make it publicly available and to allow people to collaborate without ever having to think about the licensing and so the reason that people put software up there without a license on it was because no one had mentioned to them that all of their collaborators would be acting illegally if they downloaded the software because they hadn't put a license on it uh, when you explain that to people they very hurriedly put a copy of the gpl or the mit license on their software so that their friends are not acting illegally and couldn't be prosecuted by a future bad actor uh, and so i think that what you're looking at there is that people working or using technology have a an incorrect balancing of the value of the different aspects of agency that the technology delivers in their lives so post open source is the flavor that software developers have um, the the com compulsion to share photos on instagram or to share personal information on facebook is 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 how things work out over there uh, and i i really think there is a need for more public education on that uh, it almost you know again in the in the us one of the great things you do in your education system is you insist on people learning civics when they're young uh, and i think that there is a need for a similar digital civics to say to people you know everything you do has got a, has got a potential negative consequence and whenever you're making a choice you have to ask about that potential negative consequence and make sure you balance it with the positive outcome and that needs drumming into people from the point where they're old enough to click a mouse button. Uh, and if we don't do that, we're going to have a, a an army of uh, idiocracy extras marching <laughs> into a future where they simply do what feels good, regardless of how it destroys their democracy that they enjoy. So invest in Gatorade is the message I'm hearing here. Um, I have, Josh has a question. I'd love uh, to come back to Amory's question. What does Simon consider to be the best and and the best and higher ed contribution of an open source uh, software foundation. I'm sorry. So, yeah, I'll have a go at that, Josh. I, I think the, 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 the very best thing that a, an open source foundation can do for you is make sure you never have to worry about who owns the stuff and who speaks for it. Uh, foundation will be the stuff so you don't have to ask those questions. And it will be one that makes sure that the things that are said on your behalf in public are the things you expected. Uh, that all sounds very boring, but ultimately those are the, the, you know, who owns the stuff and who speaks for us are the two things that a foundation does, really is there to do. And if they do that in a way that doesn't surprise you, that is the very best and highest contribution. And the who speaks for us thing is going to become more and more important as regulation becomes endemic in, 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 in each society. Because um, having a foundation that stands up and speaks for you and does it in a way that is compelling, changes the legislation and doesn't do any collateral damage in the process, turns out that's quite hard. Uh, I've been watching foundations trying to influence the CRA in Europe and some of them, their contributions are positively harmful. They leave legislators feeling that they're attacked even when they do the right thing, for example. Um, and so I, that, you know, that's the highest calling of a foundation is to 
make sure you never have to ask questions about who owns the stuff and who speaks for it. Uh, so I'll just, we're almost at the top of the hour. So uh, let's just, uh, I'll open it up if anyone wants to add a question to the chat. Um, and while folks are potentially typing, I guess, I must, um, what about a piece of advice? You've got uh, a collection of folks here that are arranged from um, project developers and maintainers who are trying to raise awareness and adoption of their tools, foster and communities of practice and collaboration. You've Thanks. got um, uh, folks from organizations, uh, universities and, and, and research institutions who are trying to convince their administrations, their deans, their presidents, their provosts that open source or these tools should be considered and change policy and practice. Do you have any advice for the uh, the folks swimming in open source and higher ed uh, and and how they can better uh, work with their own constituents and maybe even reach out and partner with the broader open source community? Right. Well, I mean, the, the most basic piece of advice is to never forget that the reason we're doing open source is to guarantee the agency of users. Uh, because all of the when you come to arguing the individual arguments in all of those cases, ultimately all the arguments come back to that assumption. If, if your assumption is that you're trying to get something for free, you, you discover that the actions you take are the wrong actions. Uh, because when people outside the open source world look at that, they find other ways of getting stuff for free, like stealing it or uh, 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 you know go, going to a supplier that gives them three years credit those also get it to get it to you for free and they're they are less burdensome and less costly at the point when you save the money they're very burdensome three years down the road when you go to prison or when you find that the supplier is now going to charge you a million million dollars a month because you're locked in totally but at the time when you do the thing free is not the answer what really matters is the user agency and so when you're having arguments i i suggest that you 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 check that the argument that you're using resolves down when you when you strip away all all the conceptual layers to we want to guarantee agency for users uh, when it comes to peak researchers at universities i very much encourage you to help um uh, licensing departments recognize that there are more ways of gaining a benefit from uh, an invention than just seeking immediate funds. Uh, a great way to gain benefit from an invention is to become the, the leader in that technology in the market as well as in the academic sector. And you do that by creating a community around it and guaranteeing the agency of the par participants in that community. Uh, I think a lot of innovation departments need to learn the lesson that if they just license patents today they just get the patent revenue and uh, that's much very small because the adoption is low whereas uh, if they create a market for the technology then the ability to create downstream benefits for the university is likely to be much greater it takes more skill but it's likely to be much greater <coughs> when it comes to using tools um uh, I, I'd encourage people to there on uh, the user agency when things change, uh, because most of the choices you make in software tooling in, in uh, uh, institutions, they all look good the day you release it and the day you start doing it, and they only suck in three years' time. So you just gave your, your K-12 through schools iPads, Everyone has now got an iPad because you got that great donation from the, the, the PTA. Uh, three years down the road, when they all need replacing, the PTA is less excited about giving you the same amount of money increased for inflation to do exactly the same, to achieve exactly the same objective that you achieved three years ago. Uh, so I, I'd encourage you to look at what the agency of the institution will be uh, as you progress along the timeline those are the things that are compelling um uh, i would encourage you if you do if you are capable of doing so with the technologies you're using to 
um, con contribute upstream. Uh, the, the fr there's the phrase in the open source community, upstream first. Whenever you do a thing, <coughs> if you contribute it to the place where you got the software instead of to your local copy, the everybody else in the community will maintain your change for you. Whereas if you contribute it to your local repository, you have to maintain it. And so you always upstream first. And then what happens is, uh, unlike everything else in the economy, trickle down does work in open source. You contribute okay. upstream first, and it shows up in your local copy. Only now, everybody else is maintaining it, not you. Um, I think those will be those, those, that's the instant wisdom I would come up with for you. Great. Well, uh, this is the top of the hour, uh, Simon. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, we will be posting once again this on our YouTube channel for folks who want to uh, share it. Um, and I assume, Simon, if there's any questions that come in uh, either right after this or later on, I can forward them to you um, and uh, you'll you'll provide an answer. Um, yeah, well, what I'll do is I'll put in the uh, chat there for the people who are uh, here. That's my 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 personal hub all the ways of contacting me and following my cat pictures are all on that website okay well uh that's it i'm gonna go ahead and uh say goodbye officially so i can turn off the uh the recording but um thank you again it was uh it was great and uh thank you all to everyone who uh joined us today uh, please tell a friend um and we'd like to uh make sure these grow and are useful for folks. So if you have ideas or folks that you want to have us uh, invite on, please let me know. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.